Good afternoon from uh, Geneva. Thank you for joining this Resetting Geopolitics Leadership Panel. This is the fifth day of the Davos Agenda and is really focused on advancing global and regional cooperation. Last year was filled with immense uncertainties, let's face it. But one thing was made clear. Global cooperation is not a luxury, it's a necessity. COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. And yet, at the very moment that we need deeper collaboration, we have seen competitive instincts threaten to overtake cooperative mindsets. Indeed, this, fast, uh, this past fall, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the world essentially failed when it came to cooperation, unity, and solidarity. That's quite a tough message. And at such a critical and challenging moment for the world, I'm really proud that we have such a distinguished panel here to explore how we can strengthen global cooperation to ensure we exit the pandemic in a stronger position than we entered it. Joining us are Minister Kon Otaro, the Minister in Charge of Administrative Reform and Regulatory Reform of Japan, but also previously Defense, Foreign Minister. Kang Kyung-wa, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. His Highness, Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia. Retno L.P. Marsudi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia and Fu Ying, Vice Chairperson of Foreign Affairs Committee of the 13th National People's Congress, People's Republic of China. So we have a great uh, panel and we have a lot to discuss. Maybe uh, start with you, uh, Minister um, Kono uh, Taro uh, first. Uh, good to see you. We know that uh, currently you're also in charge of um, the whole COVID uh, pandemic uh, situation and handling it in Japan. Still, the numbers are very, very low. You come out of this uh, in a very strong way, but no, it's uh, all about vaccination. And we're seeing a lot of uh, like vaccination nationalism in the world. Are you concerned that um, also this COVID-19 crisis can lead to <coughs> less global solutions, even if many of the challenges we're faced with being climate change or pandemics don't know any kind of borders, we'll then uh, end up in a result where there's less multilateralism and more national focus? Or are you an optimist? Well, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's eight in the evening in Tokyo. I'm sitting in my parliamentary apartment. Uh, I just finished the dinner. And uh, now I'm uh, in charge of delivering uh, vaccine to 120 million Japanese people. And uh, I'm a little worried about the current uh, situation. When COVID-19 hit uh, everyone in a big way, we had been concerned if there might have been uh, some disruption in delivering foodstuff or importing uh, oil, natural gas, and uh, other source of energy. We were quite concerned because we heavily rely on import of uh, foodstuff and energy. But uh, thanks to everybody, uh, it didn't happen. We kept, we have been able to import uh, foodstuff, energy, and other essential stuff. Although, yes, there was a problem uh, getting masks at some time last year, but it was a very uh, short disruption. So I was very confident about the uh, global supply chain of vaccine. But uh, now I'm a bit concerned that EU has announced that EU may block the export of vaccine produced in Europe until sufficient amount uh, is provided to European people before they allow any export to the third countries. Um, 
we are planning to import vaccine produced in EU to Japan and uh, the other type of vaccine produced in United States uh, sent to Europe for packaging and then we import the viral uh, to Japan. And now we are concerned that uh, two types of those vaccine uh, may be blocked in Europe. Uh, we never suspected that. Um, so I'm very uh, concerned uh, some government may try to be more nationalistic. Uh, it is understandable to put their own people first, but uh, we are living in uh, on the same planet and the supply chain now goes global. And uh, it is not wise to start disrupting this global supply chain in one way. Then it could uh, lead to some kind of retaliation. And uh, we could end up trying to produce everything in own country. And that is not economical. And many country that is not a possible. So it is time for the leaders of the states to sit down and uh, have online conversation how we can solve this vaccine problem. We need a global vaccine strategy to deliver uh, necessary vaccine to those who are in need most. So it's time for the leaders to sit down and discuss. We hit the same issue with masks and we have seen some country trying to block export of some important material um, <clears throat> based on their global strategy or some country trying to prep the barrier suddenly uh, for the import from other country as a tool of a global strategy. We should not allow anyone to do that. Uh, that's why we set up WTO and uh, set up uh, trade rules. So we are, we are just about to see some nationalism coming up and the leader could turn inward to solve the domestic problem and put uh, people in other country in uh, down the line. So we are living in the same planet. We need to tackle the climate change together. We need to solve the uh, issue of a global disarmament issue together. And uh, we need to grow our economy together. So it is time for us to uh, get the mechanism of United Nations, EU, G20, G7, all the global mechanism we have to use and uh, solve this issue. Um, I'll stop here. Arigato. Thank you so much, Minister Konotaro. Just a short following up question and then uh, we'll move because uh, we should also look at what will be uh, the kind of collaboration we will see uh, in the years to come and not at least in your region. I mentioned, Minister, that you also have been uh, the Foreign Minister but also the Defence Minister. And previously you have also raised uh, the wish to have a stronger regional uh, cooperation with India, Australia, and the U.S. And then uh, we also know that you're collaborating uh, with the whole East uh, Asia, uh, including China, on the trade side. What are the dilemmas you're seeing uh, when it comes to priorities on values or uh, also um, really uh, the interest of uh, Japan, the, the national uh, interest? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need to uh, put the value first, the value of democracy, value of uh, rule of law, human rights, they're important. And without those values, uh, we will not be able to prosper uh, in the economy. So we are trying to uh, talk about the post-COVID uh, world. Uh, 
many defense ministers that are, I talked to when I was defense minister are quite concerned uh, this world may be divided into democracy and uh, authoritarian regime, free society versus Orwellian regime. We need to sit down with a country that has the uh, same value that put uh, uh, democracy, rule of law, human rights uh, together. We need to sit down with a country like uh, ASEAN, Republic of Korea, United States, Europe, Australia, Canada, India, you know, other like-minded country so that we can keep this uh, liberal international order that has brought about economic prosperity since the end of the World War II. Uh, so definitely we need to put the value first and then all the economic prosperity and other interests would uh, come following it. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a natural bridge uh, also to uh, you, uh, Foreign Minister of Republic of Korea, Kang kyung Wa. You have also a long uh, career uh, in the UN uh, in your past and know uh, of course, listening to uh, Minister Kono uh, Taro, but also uh, seeing what kind of cooperation do we need now dealing with COVID, uh, mm -hmm. climate change, but multilateralism uh, in general. What, what will be uh, Korea's priorities uh, moving forward and, and what is your recommendation? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's wonderful to be joining and sharing the same screen with some very good friends and partners that I've worked with over the years. This will be one of my final acts as foreign minister uh, before I depart in about a week's time. So all the more delighted that I have this opportunity to share thoughts with with you and, and through this panel with the, with the global audience. I think... You know, obviously 2020 overwhelmed all of us with the COVID-19 pandemic. And as the video um, very tellingly showed, it just exposed the weakest and the most vulnerable links in every society. But also it's been kind of a stress test for a world that was somewhat being unanchored, um, you know, very interconnected, but increasingly fragmented uh, with the tide turning against globalization. And I think COVID-19 came at the time when this fragmenting uh, global unity uh, was, was needed to be exposed somehow, and, and it certainly has been exposed in a very, very destructive way. And we failed. We failed the stress test, as, as the Secretary General has made very clear, with over 100 million affected and 2 million dead. Clearly, we have failed, and the numbers uh, continue to grow. In hindsight, I think there are lots of lessons to be learned and perhaps things we could have done differently to save more lives. But And perhaps it's excusable that we didn't know better about the novel virus or how to respond to it because it was novel. It was an unknown quantity when it struck us. But one thing was very clear from the very beginning in the early weeks, that the virus travels across borders, knows no borders. The global community is in this together. And unless the whole world is safely protected from the virus, no country no people will be fully safe again. But still, it has been an uphill battle, to put it mildly, to forge the unity of purpose needed to fight the pandemic and recover from its devastating consequences. I think the unprecedented speed with which the vaccines have been developed certainly raised hopes that the end of the pandemic is within sight. And I have to salute the researchers and scientists who have succeeded in these endeavors and, and also to the governments uh, that have funded these efforts. But I think uh, Minister uh, Kono has already pointed out the preemptive procurement and the competition over the available vaccines by some rich countries have aggravated the deepening sense of global disunity. And this is where we find ourselves. Understandably, every government's 
first priority is to keep its people safe. And thus, each government is eager to secure enough vaccines for its population. But it is hard to understand why some governments are grabbing the vaccines in volumes that are many times more than their population size. And this only exacerbates the uncertainty for the rest of the world, the other countries. Uh, others uh, are prompted uh, to scramble to get contracts for whatever is left with the pharmaceutical companies that make the vaccines. And those without the resources simply wondering whether they will ever get enough the vaccines for their own populations. And so under the circumstances, I think the COVAX facility has truly been a saving grace as, 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 um, as limited as its ambition is. And I can only be thankful to the foresight of the leaders in the WHO, Gavi and Seppi, who established the mechanism and certainly hope that it will deliver in its goal of providing the COVID-19 vaccines to 20% of the populations in all member countries equitably. And we should think seriously about turning the COVAX setup into a standing mechanism because, you know, we know that COVID-19 will not be the last story of pandemics hitting around the world. So there has to be a mechanism ready to deal with future novel pathogens and COVAX, I think, is, is worth considering and, and giving support so that it becomes a, a, a standing, a sustainable mechanism. I think we can take some lessons from the COVAX experience and apply them more generally in building these cooperative structures to support recovery from the pandemic, as well as making progress on climate change, SDGs, collective security, and other global challenges. And so let me offer some points in some very broad terms. Thank you. First, strengthen the global health governance built around the WHO. The uh, review by the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response of the performance of the WHO and member states has made an interim report of its findings and the shortcomings of the WHO setup has been made very clear. What needs to be done, uh, the reporting obligations of member states need to be strengthened and the WHO more empowered to demand that information from member states. If we are to avoid the uncertainty and transparency and distrust that had hampered the global response to COVID-19 in the initial months. And the goal has to be to ensure full information sharing, full transparency among scientists and medical professionals and disease control authorities around the world, and for their advice to be the basis on which governments make their policies and control measures. Two, secondly, tackle fake news and disinformation. Throughout the pandemic, infodemics, in the words of Director General Tedros, has had a very corros corrosive influence on efforts to contain the virus, uh, fueling fear, distrust of science, and hatred of others. And more recently, we've witnessed how misinformation and disinformation can spiral out of control and lead to mob behaviors that can destroy the very core of long-cherished institutions. So it is not enough to encounter one fake news with a fact check and correction, one misinformation plot with an investigation and criminal charge, although such a vigilant response must be pursued in every case where possible. But what is called for, I believe, is visible, persistent leadership to reestablish fact, fact as the basis on which judgments are made and truth is sought. It's been a few years since one Western publication called this the post-truth era. And I think we've become too used to that. It wasn't clear if this was meant as a cynical description of our age, of an age of too much information through too many sources and too many media, ma making it very difficult to discern fact from fiction, objectivity from subjectivity or an alarming wake-up call to the degeneration of social debate and governance that is gradually being untethered from facts and evidence. But either way, I think responsible leadership at all levels should make, should make concerted efforts, individually and collectively, 
to arrest and reverse this post-truth climate. And I think the role of global leaders, such as the Secretary General, such as the Director General, and top leaderships of individual governments, the importance of that role in this regard cannot be overemphasized. Three, strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, the COVAX facility, which indeed is a multi-stakeholder approach, has brought together governments, international organizations, researchers and experts, private charities, and private companies in search of solutions that are beneficial to all. And this should also be, and to a certain extent already is, the approach in tackling climate change, SDGs, and other global challenges. For example, I think in climate change, in many countries, private companies are way ahead of governments in their ambitions to go green. Uh, for example, the RE100 initiative, i.e. Renewable Energy 100%, is gaining impressive ground in many countries, including in my own. The P4G initiative, Partnership for Green Growth and Global Goals, is precisely aimed at strengthening the public-private partnership in tackling climate change and sustainable development goals. And Korea will be hosting the second summit meeting of the P4G in late May. And this, coupled with the ambition of the new Biden administration to hold a climate change summit, we hope this to be a vital stepping stone to a successful outcome at the COP26 in Glasgow later in the year, securing bolder, more ambitious commitments to curb carbon and other greenhouse gases under control. Thank and you. four, each country must take responsibility to restore multilateralism. The decisions of the new U.S. administration to return to the Paris Agreement and the WHO has been widely welcomed around the world, especially by countries like Korea that have been beneficiaries and advocates of multilateralism. But it will take much more than the actions on the part of the new U.S. administration to breathe new energy into the U.N. system. I think to varying degrees, the multilateral organizations that make up the UN system have been long in need of revitalization. Uh, the unilateralist tendencies of some major players have further sapped the energy out of them recently. And to be sure, there are structural impediments to a sweeping revamping of the organizations so that they become truly fit for purpose in the fast changing world. But still, Giving up or leaving the hard work to others is not an option. It is in the self-interest of each and all countries that depend on global norms and the rules-based international order to actively contribute ideas, experience, and resources to shoring up the multilateral order and its building blocks, such as the United Nations, the WHO, the WTO, the G20, the G7, and many more. And in closing, as I prepare to leave my post, I am very assured that my government will remain at the front, forefront of these endeavors. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, for the impressive job you've done um, in the years where you had uh, this portfolio of foreign minister. We're so privileged to have you here uh, during uh, your last uh, week, Minister, and we know that you will also be doing a lot of exciting things uh, in the future. I'm now turning to His uh, Highness uh, Faisal al Saud, a foreign minister of Saudi Arabia. We know there's a lot of interest always uh, to the Middle East. We know that there's also been um, a lot of uh, positive development uh, in the regional cooperation in the GCC uh, in um, the last uh, month. Uh, Gulf solidarity is one of the terms that have been coined, and maybe uh, you'll share with us, uh, Your Highness, um, what you see um, for uh, the years to come um, when it comes to GCC cooperation, but also if something from that cooperation is applicable uh, to the rest of the world. And I also have to remind uh, everyone that uh, we have now used uh, half an hour uh, on uh, two of our uh, speakers. So we have uh, 15 minutes left. So uh, we, we have to uh, really uh, show uh, solidarity with each other. Your Highness. 
Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be uh, among you today to discuss uh, this important uh, subject. Uh, I want to just say I'm glad to share once again uh, the, uh, a forum with uh, Minister Kang kyung -wa. We've shared several forums and it's always been great uh, working with her and talking to her. And uh, it's, uh, of course, unfortunate that our last uh, meeting will be over, you know, on, on such a, a forum is going to be virtually, but that's the challenges we face. But uh, we just wanted to say she's been an excellent colleague and uh, worked uh, very, very strongly exactly on the field we're talking about, which is uh, multilateralism and cooperation. Um, you know, the subject is incredibly important and uh, we've, we've seen uh, this last year into 2020 that uh, without working together, we can't really address the global challenges. And, uh, you know, the Kingdom had the presidency of the G20 during uh, 2020 and we had to very quickly shift focus uh, in our presidency agenda to deal with the challenges of COVID-19 uh, and to muster global efforts in uh, uh, responding to that. And that, uh, you know, was uh, well responded to by G20 colleagues and they uh, stepped forward and we were able to achieve a lot of cooperative efforts, including, uh, you know, $11 trillion in stimulus, uh, $15 billion of debt relief for poorer countries, $21 billion contributed to uh, a response to the pandemic, including uh, equitable uh, distribution of vaccines and including supporting uh, the COVAX facility, which I agree is something critically important. And I just hope that we can maintain that momentum because as my colleagues has mentioned, you know, we are seeing uh, some uh, uh, unfortunate backtracking, some unfortunate uh, 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 loss of that spirit. And unless we all work together to overcome the challenges of COVID-19, we are all going to continue to be at risk. And uh, key among that, of course, is equitable distribution, uh, distribution of vaccines. Uh, you know, and that links to uh, your question, because, uh, you, you know, without regional cooperation, we can't have effective global cooperation. And that's why it was important uh, that we achieve uh, what we did in uh, the uh, 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 declaration, which is bringing back uh, the GCC into full cooperation and uh, building on that, we will be able to help uh, secure uh, the regional stability, secure that we are focused within our region on developing uh, on uh, the very, um, very important opportunities that uh, we are uh, uh, we fa we have here, but also on dealing with the many challenges. And you know that cooperation will only serve to bolster the global cooperation. And you know we've heard uh, again today that uh, uh, all the challenges that we face as a global community require working together, whether it's something uh, as uh, novel as the COVID-19 outbreak, I'm sure we will have other uh, similar uh, challenges in the future, but also things like climate change. And, you know, there we see that uh, just like uh, uh, this region has played a key role in uh, powering the global energy uh, uh, needs and in helping power the global economy, we will also play an important role in meeting the, glo uh, uh, the global community's uh, net new, um, carbon neutrality targets. So we are already working uh, with our European partners in developing uh, green and blue hydrogen and uh, you know these efforts are going to be key to work uh, to achieving uh, an effective response to the challenges of climate change. So again, without working together, without effective cooperation, without a real global outlook, none of us will succeed. So the kingdom uh, will continue to work together with its partners and is focused really on delivering uh, not just uh, regional uh, cooperation, but global cooperation on all those uh, subjects that, uh, uh, that we all as a global community face. And that will take leadership and uh, responsibility and I uh, I'm sure that uh, all of our colleagues in the global community will be focused on working together on delivering that leadership that focuses on not just cooperation, but develop, uh, achieving all of those goals that uh, we are all share, which is delivering prosperity, peace and security for the people of the world. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Your Highness, uh, Shukran. Uh, just a short question before I, I go to the Indonesian uh, Foreign Minister. Um, we know that uh, there is uh, no uh, a lot of thinking around the new Biden administration and its uh, policy uh, on the Middle East. And you, Your Highness, you uh, were before also the Kingdom's ambassador to Berlin, so you know uh, also uh, Europe uh, well. Any thoughts on this? 
I think the region and the region security is, remains a key focus for both Europe and the US. Uh, we've heard uh, very uh, clear statements uh, from uh, the Biden administration and uh, the key people on foreign policy in the Biden administration that they're going to address uh, the challenges within our region with uh, very uh, open eyes and uh, a clear uh, focus on making sure that we continue to have st uh, stability and security. So, uh, we're of course going to have a, a dialogue about the various regional challenges, not least uh, Iran, Iran's uh, destabling activity and its ramping up of its nuclear program. And uh, we are I th uh, quite confident uh, that we're working with the US and our European partners, we will be able to overcome these challenges. In the end, uh, we see these challenges uh, uh, as posing a risk not just to the region, but to the global community and global prosperity. And really, what our hope is that uh, we can move from these, uh, the focus in our region on security issues and on challenges of uh, uh, a, a, a military nature to really focusing on how can we be part of delivering global prosperity global innovation and uh, being a driver of those elements. And I think that's something that both the US and uh, Europe uh, uh, agree with us on. So we will work very closely with our partners to deliver that. Shukran, Your Highness. Let's now move to Retno Marsudi, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. And uh, Minister, uh, you're also one of three co-chairs in the whole COVAX initiative uh, with Gavi. And uh, thank you for your leadership uh, on this and, and global uh, vaccination. You listen to uh, your colleagues here and um, there has been a difference different perspectives on how we can secure also multilateralism and cooperation uh, in the post-COVID world. Um, Indonesia, uh, largest uh, Muslim uh, country in the world when it comes uh, to population, also um, situated in a very interesting uh, geopolitical and security um, uh, context. So, uh, Minister, uh, your, your thoughts. Right. Well, thank you very much, Borfer, for having me. First, I would like to share the uh, same concern with my previous uh, speakers about the vaccine nationalism. And uh, thank you, uh, Taro, for mentioning uh, about ASEAN. Kungwa, thank you for mentioning about COVAX facility. And Faisal, congratulations for your leadership in the G20 last year. Borfer, two days ago, I co-chaired the COVAX AMC engagement uh, group together with Minister Karina Kohl of Canada and Dr. Lia Tadese of Ethiopia. It was attended by more than 400 participants, I think almost 500 participants. Through COVAX facility, the AMC 92 economies could obtain up to or hope to obtain up to 20% of their population. And during the meeting, we discussed various details in preparation of equitable and fair access to vaccine for all to take place. Equitable and fair access to vaccine for all countries is a very important issue. It is not only important for developing and least developed countries, but also important for developed countries and for the world. We recover stronger if we recover together. So colleagues, I'm very glad that the principle of equitable and fair access to vaccine has received strong support from all of us. And to ensure its implementation, I believe there are three main issues. First is the availability of vaccine. Here, the cooperation with manufacture is key. And in the last couple of days, as mentioned by the previous speaker, I read the blooming news that vaccine nationalism remains happening. If it is continued, for sure, it will jeopardize vaccine multilateralism. And then second is the financial support. Here, we need strong cooperation with donors multilateral development banks, philanthropies, and others. Third, readiness of developing and least developed countries to receive vaccine. This is not an easy part at all. Most likely, the vaccine that will be distributed to participants of AMC 92 
will require ultra cold chain. So the question is, do they have this kind of infrastructure? And there is also issue of regulatory and indemnity. That is another challenges for AMC 92 economies. So I have to give appreciation to Gavi, JP, WHO, and all of us, Kungwa mentioned about it, who are working night and day to materialize the hope of all of us, especially the developing and least developed countries. The fact that Gavi, Chappie, and WHO, despite the nature of the pandemic and its challenges, has mobilized all efforts to make COVAX facility work, it is a miracle. Gavi plans to pull 2 billion doses of vaccine. This is great. And it is this kind of spirit, the spirit of collaboration and cooperation that we need to continuously uh, strengthen. So please stop the politicization of vaccine. Please stop the vaccine nationalism. And we must remind ourselves, vaccine is a humanitarian issue. Vaccine is not a political issue. So it is my hope that the vaccine multilateralism succeeds. Then what we can say, multilateralism delivers. Thank you, Borja. No, thank you so much um, for that uh, very, very important uh, appeal, uh, Minister Retno Marsudi. I, I hope uh, millions of people uh, listen uh, to this. Uh, I would also then uh, like to, to go to Madame Fu uh, Ying. Um, um, you um, wrote uh, a very, very interesting article in the New York Times uh, a few days ago that I, I read with a great interest, where uh, you looked at the G2 uh, collaboration in the years to come, uh, China and the US. And I would also like this morning, I moderated a session with Prime Minister Lee from Singapore, and he said the most important relationship in the decade to come is uh, between uh, the US and China, and uh, um, we have to get it right. You even uh, coined uh, a new um, expression or, or, or a term, Madame, a competition, like co uh, cooperation and competition at the same time. So it would be very interesting to hear uh, your views on this and also related to what Minister uh, Connell uh, said at the, at the beginning. Madame. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I want to say that I share uh, the concerns and uh, propositions by the previous speakers uh, about the, the international fight against the uh, pandemic. Um, when the uh, Chinese uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping spoke uh, at the Davos agenda, his uh, special address, he, he said that humanity endured multiple crises really seen in human history. And he also said that there is no doubt that humanity will prevail over the virus and emerge even stronger from the disaster. And I also agree with you that uh, major countries, all countries in the world should join hands in fighting pandemic. And the, it has been disappointing that uh, over the past years, we haven't seen the kind of unity uh, that uh, uh, was uh, demonstrated uh, when we entered the first 21st century during the fight against uh, terrorism, for example, and the fight uh, uh, against the, 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 the general efforts to fight against the uh, financial crisis, uh, and uh, that is why uh, I think uh, I, uh, there is uh, so much attention given to the rela rela <clears throat> relationship between China and U.S., and there is such a high expectation of China and U.S. coming together, uh, joining hands together with the rest of the world to uh, uh, overcome this uh, serious uh, threat to mankind. The, mm, you mentioned my article. I think there is uh, no denying. Uh, 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 I, I think uh, we cannot underestimate 
the, the serious uh, damage the China-U.S. relationship has endured uh, over the past years. And it's a challenge for both sides to find the right way uh, forward. My observation is that the current uh, new U.S. administration needs time to es estimate what are the areas it, can, uh, it has to cooperate with China and what are the areas uh, it needs to, to manage with China, avoiding uh, conflicts. And uh, for the Chinese side, I think uh, we also need to reflect and observe uh, what is the intention, what is the next move uh, by the United States. We, all, we are all aware that in the international relations, it's very important for countries to have accurate uh, uh, judgment, accurate uh, estimation of each other, and uh, how China and U.S. define their relationship is important, not only for the two countries, but also uh, to the world. I noticed that the new White House spokesperson, uh, Jane Psaki, uh, said in uh, one of his statements to the effect that uh, strategic uh, competition with China is a defining future of the 21st century. Uh, admittedly, there are elements of, of competition in our economic relationship, which as I, as I described in my article to the New York Times, I even dubbed uh, uh, a new word, co-opetition, co cooperation plus competition. But I think that competition should be fair and for the purpose of a common progress, that's the kind of competition which uh, exists in, the re in any relationship. But the concept of uh, strategic competition, I, I think it, it won't find uh, much agreement uh, here in China. China's uh, fundamental view for the 21st century is to maintain peace and cooperation, peace and stability. And China has no intention vying for world dominance. You don't hear people here in China advocating for uh, competing with the United States for world dominance. It just doesn't exist. Should uh, uh, America hegemonic, hegemonistic power uh, appear to be on, in some kind of decline, it would be, uh, it has to be caused by its own mistakes, like uh, strategic overstretch. The future world change, from our point of view, is more likely to be multipolarization rather than hegemonistic replacement. I myself was quite astonished, you notice in my article, by the unbridled and chaotic policy measures that was coming out of Washington over the past years. And I'm, I'm curious too to see what's next. Most people expect that there can be some kind, some rational and uh, professional approach and sensible policies. On the part of China, uh, there has been some uh, positive signals. Uh, in his congratulatory uh, telegram to President Joe Biden, which was sent on November the 25th, 2020, Chinese President Xi Jinping said that promoting healthy and stable development of China's U.S. relations not only serves the fundamental interests of the people of both countries, but also meets the common expectation of the international community. So, um, in addition, the Chinese Consular and Foreign Minister Wang Yi has proposed that the two sides work out working lists on areas of cooperation, areas of dialogues, and issues that need to be uh, properly handled. Uh, you asked about cooperation. Uh, I think uh, many of you mentioned that the United Global Response to COVID-19 is the most pressing task for the world today. And I think China, US, and together with other countries, we should encourage health experts and uh, scientists to uh, maximize their role and to uh, intensify research to help fight the virus. We also need to cooperate on vaccine development and the distribution, as was mentioned. 
and which will also coordinate the policies on such issues as cross-border traveling, on global uh, norms uh, on, uh, regarding the measures, the efforts we're taking against the pandemic. Furthermore, discussion and cooperation on global issues such as climate change also needs to be resumed, and the American return to the Paris Agreement is a welcoming step. Uh, there's also the need for cooperation in the newly emerging areas like AI, uh, like 5G. Uh, I think some of the Chinese com uh, companies have been successful, and that seemed to have sparkled, sparked uh, fear in the U.S., which I think is entirely unnecessary. Instead, I think there's a need for joining hands between China, U.S., and other countries to develop the norms uh, governing the application of AI technologies, which is a, a urgent, in urgent need. So, generally speaking, uh, I think the world problems are complex, and China's approach is to upheld multilateralism and develop a community with a shared future for mankind. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to use uh, the last minutes, uh, ministers, excellencies, uh, if you're okay, to build on uh, what uh, just Madame uh, Fu Jing now addressed. Uh, probably uh, one of the most defining uh, geopolitical uh, developments this decade will be uh, the relationship between the largest and second largest economy uh, in the world, uh, China and the US, and it will also have implications uh, for all of us. Uh, is it possible to compete and cooperate at the same time? You know, uh, 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 US President once said it's possible to chew gum and, and walk at the same time. It was uh, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, that uh, said this. But at the same time, there is also worries that there will be a total decoupling. Uh, there will be two, like two different systems, like a Chinese system and then an American uh, system. Maybe uh, going to uh, Minister uh, Kono uh, first. You, you heard uh, what Madame Fu Yang uh, said. No, you've seen the first reactions also uh, from uh, the Biden administrations. Uh, Japan is one of the largest FTI investors in China, rely a lot on trade with China, but at the same time, you also said you're very supportive of this alliance of uh, democracies. Short comment from you, then I'll go uh, to uh, Korea, uh, and uh, then to Indonesia, and then to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Minister Kono. Yes, the biggest difference between now and uh, during the Cold War is uh, Soviet economy was quite independent, but the Chinese economy is quite integrated into the global uh, supply chain. So we definitely have to work together and uh, we definitely have to manage the situation. Uh, that's for sure. But uh, it seems to me that there are two different values uh, and uh, we really hope that we shouldn't uh, separate uh, this liberal international order between two, two camps. So we definitely, we recognize that uh, some countries have a different political system, but uh, if we can share the value and if we can manage the situation, I think we can save the planet. No, thank you. And um, uh, let's then go to uh, Minister Kang uh, Kyung Wa. Um, you heard Minister uh, Kono earlier on. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think uh, I, I share the same points. I think the the world is too too interconnected. Um, th our businesses work all over the world. We have businesses in the hugely invested in China and the United States. China is our number one trading partner. The United States is our second. And I think the idea of decoupling, maybe in certain areas where it, it's of crucial strategic interest to countries, uh, that, that I think may already be happening. But overall, this idea of a complete decoupling, I think is unrealistic. I think the, the business interest around the world is too, too uh, entrenched um, for that to happen competition certainly in certain areas but cooperation so i think ambassador fuing had it just right when she said um co i think um 
on values, I think, yes, we all, you know, Korea is a very vibrant liberal democracy, uh, you know, hugely places huge importance on, on human rights and, and, and freedom of expression and so on and so forth. And, and we very much share that like-minded with other liberal democracy, but that should not prevent us from cooperating with uh, societies that don't necessarily share those values. Um, you know, the world is a very complicated place and reality is not not clean cut. I always say reality is very messy. <laughs> and I think the job of leaders at national level and global levels is to manage that messiness and find solutions that are beneficial um, to all. Win-win, understand each other, and try to find ways that are beneficial to all sides. Not easy. But I, that uh, no, nobody said that the work, uh, that the, the job of being foreign ministers or leading governments or leading global organizations was an easy, easy job. It's a tough job. It is. I, I think we all can subscribe uh, to that. Uh, Minister uh, Ratna Marsudi, um, realities can be uh, messy. I think also um, Indonesia is very close to both the U.S. and, and, and China, um, and also being uh, a democracy. Uh, reflections on, on your side, how are you going to do this balancing? Do you see a decoupling? Uh, Borja, you asked about whether compete and cooperation is possible. The answer is yes, and Indonesia hopes that ASEAN and China can cooperate better. That is my first point. My second point, ASEAN will continue to play its role to maintain peace and stability in the region. And then my third point, my last point, ASEAN offers to all our partners, including the US and China, to cooperate with ASEAN, including through the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So let us mainstream the cooperation instead of rivalry. Thank you, Borja. No, thank you so much, Minister. Your Highness, uh, traditionally Saudi Arabia has been uh, very, very close uh, to uh, the United States. But we've also seen recently that the footprint of uh, China is increasing, increasing uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. So uh, reflections on this uh, mm, collaboration or competition, the comp competition appears from, from your Highness side? Uh, well, the Kingdom, of course, is an integrated part of the global economy, and that means that we are uh, strong partners for both the US and China economically. We're also, of course, uh, strategically very much aligned with the US. And I think we have seen that cooperation is possible, and not just possible, it is absolutely necessary. Uh, without uh, cooperation, uh, we, we can't deliver prosperity, we can't deliver security uh, to our individual nations or to the global community. Really, we are too integrated, we are too dependent on each other, uh, and we receive too much benefits from each other's uh, uh, cooperation and trade for uh, it to make sense to uh, move to an aggressive posture or a um, um, uh, posture of uh, competition and decoupling. Now, of course, we always compete, and that's uh, you know that's fair. And that, uh, it's uh, it's a competition is healthy because it ensures the delivery of uh, uh, more efficient uh, forms of uh, uh, governance. But as long as that competition is not uh, 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 you know is in the realm of uh, the, the corporate world and not you know a competition of geostrategic, uh, geostrategic uh, dimensions. Uh, we can manage. And I, it's important that we understand that in order for us to uh, uh, protect the global community and to work uh, towards delivering prosperity, as I mentioned, and even respond to challenges like COVID-19, which is not the last challenge of the sort that we will face, we will have to maintain the focus on cooperation and integration. Otherwise, we put all of us at risk. Shukran. I think, uh, Madam uh, Fu Ying, uh, you will have the privilege then uh, to have uh, the kind of uh, famous last words there. Of course, I will have the right to thank everyone uh, after you. Uh, we're running uh, really on our time, so if you could do it in a couple of minutes, that would be great. But you will have the last words from China this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger's visit to China. And for half a century, we have managed, China has uh, successfully integrated into the world economy, uh, at the same time maintained its own political in integrity. So that shows that, uh, the, that it is possible to have uh, both to work with other countries in the areas we can, at the same time defending our fundamental interests. So we dis disagree with the decoupling. And we also, I think Asia, uh, the Indonesian Foreign Minister uh, mentioned that Asia, ASEAN is exemplary in demonstrating the kind of spirit of openness, of inclusiveness. And Asia has uh, uh, been able to maintain, every country maintain their political, their uh, political integrity at the same time having openly have a wider uh, economic and, and cultural contacts. So I, I think as long as we have this uh, uh, spirit of uh, mutual respect, respecting that there is a boundary for political system, and then uh, uh, respecting the fact that each system, this each culture can succeed in its own way, uh, uh, it, it, with that kind of spirit, I'm sure that we can have a both. Thank you. No, uh, Chacha, thank you so much to all of you. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion, and I, I'm so thankful uh, for your contributions. Uh, it is uh, such an uh, excellent uh, panel, and of course, a special thank you uh, to Minister Kang uh, Kyung Wa, uh, since there's only one <laughs> week uh, left uh, being foreign minister. But I can assure you there is also life after being foreign ministers. You know, the former Norwegian prime minister, Kori Vilok, once said to me, you know, it's uh, much nicer to have been prime minister than being prime minister. So on that note, and I'm also sure that um, the discussion about the G2, China, US relationship, we will have ample time to come back to in the coming decade and I hope I can also invite these panelists again uh, on that topic but also other extremely important uh, topic uh, like uh, the fight against the pandemic and also how to strengthen global cooperation. Thank you so much from Geneva and uh, good night to you in Asia. Thank you.